And that's where all the 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 build, building up of self-knowledge occurred because I would fail miserably at times. But this is the key. I knew that if I kept going, it wasn't like a 46-day winning streak. I knew that if I kept going, if I got through boot, boot camp, eventually God would allow me to be a soldier in the war. Welcome to another episode of The Catholic Gentleman. We are so blessed that you are here. Who are we? We're your host. I'm John Heinen. We've got uh, Devin Shaw and we've got Sam Guzman. And we love coming every week to talk about these important uh, subjects and topics and themes that just uh, affect men's lives day in and day out. And so we thank you for deciding to join in, uh, to join us today. So coming up, we are going to be discussing this Lent. Um, and this might come as a shock to you, but Lent is in two weeks. And so I don't want you to be caught unaware. And so that's why we decided that this is going to be coming up. And so we're going to talk about how to accomplish the best Lent. We're going to give you a strategic guide step by step in order to do that. We're also going to answer a question from one of our listeners on chastity and how to uh, fight social media and those things which are keeping him down. And we look forward to that. And finally, if you enjoy this episode, we always launch this public version, and then we have a full extended version every week that goes into Catholic Gentleman Plus. In addition, on Catholic Gentleman Plus, we come out with monthly sessions. This month, we just launched Spiritual Warfare, where Sam, myself, guest experts are talking about spiritual warfare and what we need to do and arm ourselves with as men head over there we got a lot of great content that's actually the ninth session that we've come out with and we just keep on coming out with them each and every month you can get them all over at catholic gentleman plus great way to support us and we appreciate that we also want to reach more men. So if you are following us on Apple or Spotify or YouTube, make sure you click that subscribe button. Uh, give us uh, four or five stars. That helps expand the algorithm so that we can five reach stars. more and more. Five, yeah, I was going to say. Five, five. five. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Sorry, my, my <laughs> humility got in the way. Sorry about that. Um, and, um, and so um, so anyways, yeah, we, we love it. So uh, De Devin, Sam, how are you guys doing? Devin, I know you gave uh, some talks this weekend to a bunch of men. Yes. How did those go? Yes, it was amazing. We had a great group up in North Dakota and uh, guys came from Canada. A guy came from wow. Pittsburgh and it was just amazing. You know, it begins with guys arms crossed, you know, mm -hmm. looking a little stern. And by the end of the retreat, these guys are moving in the Holy Spirit and opening themselves up to the Lord in a powerful way. So it was incredible. Uh, I just a shout out to the men in North Dakota and Canada and Pittsburgh. God bless you all. You guys are great men. Amen. Yeah, that's wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, Sam, how was your week? It's been going really well. Um, you know, we had some uh, interesting weather here in Oklahoma. So school was canceled, like um, mail didn't run or anything. It was, it was, it was ice, which, you know, growing up, uh, up north, like snow doesn't intimidate me, but ice actually can be extremely dangerous. There's not really any good way to drive in ice. Uh, so anyway, I was I was just thankful that power lines didn't come down or a tree didn't come down on our house or whatever. But we had a we had a pretty good ice storm at the beginning of this week. So. Oh, praise God! Well, I'm glad that you guys are okay, though. That's the praise God that you guys didn't get hurt. And um, and so. <laughs> Yeah, I gave a talk on Thursday. I know I mentioned that to Devin, and it yeah, there was something unique about the talk that I gave to these men. A little over 50 men showed up, and it was uh, an awesome experience. But they started uh, the uh, the evening with scotch and uh, whiskey, and so right they had on. an hour of scotch and whiskey. And I tell you what, if you want to have a good audience, if you want to get a standing ovation, <laughs> make sure that you uh, prep the event with scotch and whiskey beforehand. <laughs> and so, um, yeah. so blessed uh, to join the Claritas men's group there in Dallas and uh, be able to uh. speak to them. We had just such a great turnout, and it was uh, really a blessed uh, experience for me as well. So. Mm. But uh, note for future events. Um, okay, wonderful. So uh, today we are, we're going to talk about Lent. And and as I mentioned uh, earlier, it's on February 14th. That's Valentine's Day. But men, we are going to abstain from meat and we are going to fast and we're going to do what's necessary in the heart of the church um, and push February 15th, you know, or Valentine's to February 15th, if, if need be. Uh, we're basing this talk on um, Devin's book uh, called Jesus's Way right here. And I do want to just 
do a little uh, mention of this. We had a conversation about this last year, and we ended up selling, um, moving 500 plus uh, books. And the testimonies that I received from men and women, honestly, about how transformative this was for them, just in myself included, I'm not going to lie. I, I went through it and it was the best uh, uh, devotional that I had gone through. And I'm not just saying that because Devin's with us. It was something that was <laughs> was was truly transformative. Today's episode, though, is going to be focused on the principles of this book while so that you can adopt those yourself, whether you get it or not. If you want to get it, we have 400 copies at The Catholic Gentleman. Um, you can head over to our store there. Link is in the show note. We've got 100 available now, and we've got another 300 that are going to be shipped to us and available before Lent. However, just to make sure, everybody who purchases, we're going to give you the first 10 days free in a reflection PDF just to make sure that you can get started, but want to be completely honest with that. I imagine all of them are going to move. It really is an incredible book. But have you found yourself stumbling into Lent? Have you found yourself surprised waking up on Ash Wednesday and being like, oh goodness, it's Ash Wednesday. Do I need to go to Mass or do I not need to go to Mass? Uh, should I go get ashes in the morning or in the evening? You know, how important is this? What am I going to be giving up, right? I have experienced that myself and unfortunately fallen into many a situation where it's not until Friday that I've kind of figured out what I'm going to be doing during Lent. Don't let that be you, right? Learn from me. Learn from my mistakes. And, uh, and Don't be and start- John. Don't be John. That's amen to that, right? That can be a motto. Be a man, be a saint. Don't be John. And, um, and um, oh man, and, uh, yeah, no, I agree. And so I, I want you to, I want you to plan. I want you to be able to go deeper. I want you um, to give you this, this one, two, three step to make this um, better. Because so very often we approach Lent with sort of like a white knuckled approach, right? I call that the evil step twin of like true self-mastery and meekness. And it's it's this idea that we just have to get through it ourselves and we have to labor on. And if we accidentally um, trip and fall, we need to chastise ourselves and fall into uh, despair. These are all things that we want to talk about today. So I love Lent. I know we mentioned it on our Advent episodes. Actually, Currently, this season of my life, my favorite time of the year. I love the challenge. I love being able to refocus myself um, on uh, with a little bit more zeal and with a little bit more intentionality and preparation for Easter. Uh, so, learning uh, and looking to Saint Leo as a bit of a guide, I grabbed uh, just his quote from the Apostle Paul, where he said, "All men should be turning to this." When he said, "Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, mm-hmm. now is the day of salvation." There in Second Corinthians. And mm-hmm. so let us let us take on that mantle and let us be very focused within it. So um, turning now to the first principle that we are going to discuss is what is the purpose of Lent? And so I'd love to turn to you, Devin, and get your thoughts right out the gate on what is the purpose of Lent? Why do we need, men need Lent and what should we be doing to better our lives during Lent? Yeah. I love what you said about, you know, all of a sudden Lent is upon you, you know, you you know, and you're like, oh, I'll give up lima beans. And you have this guilt complex. You're like, no, I'll give away all my money. And then you're like, oh, that's too hard. And then you're like, I'll give up beer. And then you're like, well, well, except on Sundays and then accepted the guys group and except on date night. And then pretty soon March 19th. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. exactly. So, you know, I mean, I think, I think it's interesting because we say things like, I want to be holier. I want to be a saint. I want to get to heaven. And all those are good, mind you, but these desires are a bit general. They're nondescript. They're indefinite, really, because what is holier? What is a saint? What is the way to heaven? And I think that we have to understand, we know the way to heaven. Jesus is the way to heaven. And Jesus is the life we are to live. And Jesus is the truth that navigates us to sainthood. Jesus says this in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And therefore, I think that there is only one purpose really to Lent, you know, and that is to know Jesus and to become like him. And when we go into Lent with that purpose, everything changes. Because if you give a boy just, you know, if you give a boy a a Red Ryder BB gun Mm -hmm. and you just, hey, go play with it, he's going to shoot it, shoot at anything, right? He's going to shoot at squirrels. He's going to shoot at cans. He's going to shoot at his sister. You know, he's going to shoot anything. And it it looks like he's- <laughs> he's going to shoot out. his eye out. <laughs> That's right. And the thing is, is it looks like he's shooting at something, but actually he's aimless. Mm-hmm. And without a target for Lent, we're really aimless. So I think that Jesus is, in a sense, the spiritual target that we're shooting at. So we want to heed his call to learn from me so that we can become like him. And I think I say this in the introduction that the key to the spiritual life is identifying the correct target and shooting for it. 
Because if we have an incorrect target, though we hit the bullseye every time, we're going to miss the mark. And so Lent is about becoming the one thing that really matters, and that is to become like Jesus, like Galatians 2.20, right? It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. So I think that this runs totally against what, you know, some people call the postmodern Protestant subjectivism. And what I mean by that is there's this, there's this disorder of, of subjectivism where we're so focused on the me. How do I improve myself? How do I become the better self? How do I become more of this or more of that or even more popular? You know, and I think that, and, and, and we hear the stats, the age group between 18 and 32 are the most depressed, anxious people in this world. And why? Look at social media, because it's all about that. And so this is the ticket out of depression. This is the ticket out of anxiety is to focus on Jesus and to ask him to reveal himself to us so that we can know him and then we can become like him. That's the key. Absolutely. Sam, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the meaning and purpose of Lent here. Yeah, I think the template for this uh, Lenten experience uh, obviously, it goes back to Christ and in the desert, uh, but also even before that, if you look at the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, if you will, there was these constant moments, starting with like the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but later on, the whole the whole nation of Israel, the whole people of the Jewish people, where there was constant unfaithfulness to God. And yet there was, God never gave up on his people. He would send prophets. He would, you know, sometimes even send persecutors in the form of invading nations and things like that. All for the goal of getting the people of God to return to him, to return to their loving relationship with God. And they were constantly being tempted by these, these pagan religions um, and you know, the, the goods of the world, you know, the, even, even sometimes wanting to return to their slavery in Egypt, because at least they knew what to expect. Mm -hmm. And like, there was these just constant infidelity, but also God never stopped pursuing them. And so I think, and then there would be these beautiful moments all throughout the, the old covenant, all the old, the old Testament scriptures, well, people got like they God got through to them. All of a sudden, they woke up to their sinfulness, their infidelity, their ingratitude, their lack of faith, and they would they would be heartbroken, and they would rend their clothes, and you know pour sackcloth and ashes all over themselves, and they would return to God. Um, and sometimes that would last a long time, and sometimes it would last a very short time. But but the point being, they came back to God with all of their heart. And Lent is about answering and saying, yes, I return to you, Lord, uh, with a broken and contrite heart. And I think that's what we should be seeking this Lent. Yeah. Amen. Oh, I appreciate both of it. Both you and Devin and Sam have just beautifully stated. I, I think it's, it's all so true. And when I'm reflecting on mm -hmm. Lent, I... I do. I, I see, okay, wait. So this idea of fasting, this idea of prayer, this idea of uh, almsgiving are things that we should be doing throughout the entire year. And men, we should. We should absolutely be doing those things. But as Sam, you're getting at, there's a certain lackluster that, that happens because of the frailty of our flesh, because of the um, uh, immediacies of all of our needs throughout the year that we end up just kind of um, forgetting those things, forgetting this relationship with God and this union with God. And, and we know we've talked frequently that we have been separated. And because of the fall of man, we've been separated, you know, spiritually from God, um, internally in our relationship with ourselves and our relationship with others. And that's where the church gets the prayer, fasting, and alms given from prayer, reuniting ourselves with God, right? Um, fasting, self-mastery, you know, over ourselves, reuniting ourselves that has been lost because of the fall. And then almsgiving, because a true man can't be a true man unless he gives forth. And we're going to talk later on about that. But I think you just hit the nail on the head, uh, Sam, when you were just talking about that, that reuniting, I think that that's what we're called to as men here. It's just kind of that renewed vigor, that renewed excitement, that renewed zeal in our hearts and our minds to pay attention 
to these things which have waned throughout the year so that we can present ourselves as an acceptable man before Christ, like Christ, at the Easter feast. That's our goal. That's our that's our um, our drive. And I would say, Sam, you said another thing about um, that we see it as like subtraction instead of addition. Mm-hmm. And and immediately I thought of this the the self emptying, right? That this is the call of man. That we have to we have to subtract these things which are keeping us from the overabundance, the superabundance uh, of God's grace and his filling within us, which is exactly right. Focus on that overabundance. Focus on that super, you know, um, uh, amount of, of grace that we can receive by emptying ourselves from these attachments which keep us down. And that Lent gives us this time period to do that, to become more like Christ, to become better men and um, and men that the world needs. Amen. Yeah, I think I love this, you know, the idea that sometimes we can look at Lent as subtraction rather than addition. And obviously it's a both and game. But I mean, if you look at your relationship with your wife, for those of us who are married, if I just abstain from demeaning her, if I abstain from, you know, leaving my socks on the floor or whatever I do, that's, you know, going to cause a fight. If I, yeah, even if I abstain from fighting or arguing with her, I still have to fill that back up, you know, and that's the part of the reuniting and the reunion. That's the whole idea of reunion. Union is a giving back of oneself to the other so that the other can give themselves back to you. And there's a, there's a oneness. And so with Lent, I think that we have the idea it's a giving up. It's a giving up. Yes, it is. But it's also, a, like you say, John, a giving forth. It, mm-hmm. it, to me, it's the both and principle. And without both of those, I just feel like it's lacking. You know, I just feel like it's empty. So like you said, Sam, I think you did, said about we make this space so that that space can be filled with, no, you said it, John, we make the space so that God can fill that space. That's beautiful. That's exactly what this season's all about. Yeah. Amen. And so shifting, I want to talk about how we can make this happen as men. And there's some other important principles to keep in mind as we go through Lent. Principles that I mentioned are are reflected in this book, but understanding our lives today as men. And I think that that first one is this need for incremental growth in spiritual and physical practices, right? And I'm going to tell a little bit of a story here because there's a great book, one that I admire, thanks be to uh, Father David Abernathy and his suggestion, and it's To Love Fasting. And it was written by a Benedictine monk there in 1985 who decided to take upon the strict observance of fasting uh, as Benedict uh, um, prescribed uh, even though his community was was not doing that at all. And uh, his name is uh, Father Albert Vug. Um, I said that with the best French that I could do. <laughs> and uh, and what was what was fascinating when you go through the book is that he's very clear that it took him four to five years to get to the point in just fasting and abstinence from food. That's what we're talking about here. Not fasting from social media, fasting. I've got an issue with those forms. I mean, those are abstinence. Those are self-disciplines. Those are things that you should be doing. But to call them fasting, I think it actually um, um, downplays the importance of, of fasting from food. So uh, put a pin in that. <laughs> not, not the point of what I'm trying to say here. But he talked about how there was five years to get there. And that when some of the men... Uh, years later at the monastery, some of the brothers saw how well he was doing with the strict observance of the fast. They wanted to start doing it, and they wanted to start doing it instantly. Mm. And so he was would tell them what he was doing, and then they would start doing it instantly. And he said that many of them were overcome with vicious nightmares and actually uh, like body tremors throughout the day. Now, his strict observance of the fast, just so you know, was just eating one meal a day period, and drinking only a couple cups of water during that one meal a day, and that was it. And so it was incredibly uh, severe. He loved it. So it's such a beautiful book. But again, it took him five years to get there. And he was called by God. And he also lived a hermitage, uh, you know, lifestyle. So I'm not using that as the example. I think we should all be pursuing that. And there's a dynamism to fasting. But my point um, bringing this up is that we have to start small 
in order to progress successfully in God's grace and to avoid that sort of uh, white knuckling um, uh, thing of uh, that we can fall into. So, Sam, I'd love to hear your thoughts as a mental health counselor about the importance of making these little uh, one degree uh, changes and not trying to dive in. If you haven't been fasting all year, all of a sudden you you know you hit the accelerator on fasting and what generally that means for us. Yeah, this, this goes, this is absolutely applicable. And I, I have this conversation with my clients frequently. Um, we all want breakthroughs. We all want a big leap. Um, and we hear stories of that. Like sometimes that does happen where it's like somebody's going along, um, not really changing much at all. And then suddenly something hits them like a thunderbolt and everything, Thing changes overnight and they're like just renewed interiorly and just on fire for all the right things and like and it's just amazing and everybody has that kind of that that image in mind like i'm trying to quit some addiction and and, and bam i just get this 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 impulse of grace and it's gone forever mm. i never have to struggle with it again um or like I'm, I'm just depressed and all of a sudden one day i just wake up and i feel great and i don't know what happened but i'm I'm like changed inside, whatever, whatever your issue is. We all want that big leap. We all want that breakthrough. We all want that massive, like road to, uh, you know, the Damascus moment, like St. Paul, like in just we're, we meet Christ and everything changes overnight. Like, and that, again, that does happen, but it's not very common. And it's frustrating for people. And they're like, why am I not changing faster? But yeah, I think it's the growth is slow, right? Like I watch uh, videos of my kids from like two years ago and I'm shocked at like how much smaller they look. They, like, they just look like babies, you know? Yeah. And like now they look so big, but I'm like, what happened? But they've been growing all the time. It's just slow and incremental. If you know, if you measured them three times a day, you still wouldn't notice that growth, but it is there. And that's often how, it works in the spiritual life and in the interior life. It's subtle, subtle, it's slow. And why is that? Like, I think there's a couple of reasons for that, at least. One is the danger of pride. Like if we were able to just change on a dime, mm. it could really go to our heads and we could have less compassion for other people who aren't growing as quickly. We could uh, think that we're something special, you know, or, or whatever. And like, and the other thing I think is the other danger is like, the thing we have to remember is God wants our maturity. He doesn't want to make it easy for us. Sometimes he just wants us to show up and do the work, do the interior work, struggle with these issues a little bit, wrestle with yourself, you know, like press on through the difficulties and like all of those things, that work, that labor, that interior labor actually is where the growth comes from. Um, as much as we want to escape that, as much as we want the easy way out, like that actually sometimes is the most productive thing for our soul. The thing that we need the most is that struggle. Um, and if it went away again, it would not be good for us in the long term. Um, so God's fully capable of healing you in an instant, but if you're struggling with something over and over, know that that's where the work lies. That's where the growth is, ha is the call is happening in your life. And, and don't run away from it. Don't shirk that. Um, enter into the struggle uh, and, and God will reward that. Amen. And the success is going to be guaranteed with God's grace. And so, Devin, in your book, you did such an incredible uh, you laid it out such an, in such an incredible way how to do this. So obviously you were inspired uh, by this sort of incremental growth strategy. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. Yes. Well, Sam, excellent points. I, I love that. I think that sometimes just with Lent or with religion and, and spirituality, if you will, um, we get it backwards, you know, bass backwards, as they say. So <laughs> I think with Lent, especially, we look at it like almost like a competition, especially as men, we have to win. So we, we look at it as a competition or a challenge. And so like Lent and Easter is a little bit like March Madness, the final four in the NCAA title game. You know, it's like, okay, I'm going to have this 46 day winning streak. But if that winning streak ends on day 17, I'm disheartened and I kind of give up and maybe I keep going, but my heart's not really in it because I know I'm not, I didn't, I didn't win the national championship mm -hmm. or whatever. And I, I think <clears throat> this is 
this is important that we we change our mindset because way way we think determines the trajectory of our lives. Mm-hmm. So we need to put on the mind of Christ. And I think that in this case, Lent is not so much like a competition or tournament. I think it's more like minor league tryouts or spring training. You know, I think that it's not like the actual battle of going to war. It's like Jesus boot camp. So Jesus takes us into the miserable place of boot camp because it's the place of failure. It's the place of humiliation. It's a place of falling and rising again and again, each day and beginning again and falling in the mud and running and getting tired and have to do more push-ups. And, you know, it's just this idea of coming to this deep self-knowledge because I think when we are removed from Lent or a, a season of penance, what happens to us is we get overinflated with who we are. Oh yeah, I can do that. Oh yeah, I got that. But that training camp, that preseason kind of boot camp, that really helps us to come in contact with who we really are. And human development, you know, acquiring intellectual capital, you know, technical technological advancement never does it go from zero to 10. They grow and increase incrementally. So I think there's a both end of this. I think, you know, imagine a two-year-old who attempts to operate a banking institution. Everybody loses their money. But on the other hand, imagine that two-year-old remaining at that maturation level for 30 years, right? And I think that that's what a lot of us do with Lent. What we do is we have 10 Lents, 15 Lents, 20 Lents, 30 Lents, and we give up the same exact things. Mm -hmm. So every year we give up smoking. Every year we give up drinking alcohol or sweets. And we kind of become stuck in this spiritual retardation. And so we want to grow. I remember when I was pushing, I, I, I like to build boulder walls and I was taking a wheelbarrow and I wanted to get more boulders in that wheelbarrow so that I didn't have to have as many loads. And I was pushing uphill. And if you ever put too much in the wheelbarrow, what's going to happen when you're going uphill? It's going to come back on you. It's going to fall and it might fall on you. And that has happened. And that's what happens if we shoot for the gold. We just want to put too much in our spiritual wheelbarrow and we just want to do too much in Lent. On the other hand, we can like carry one little rock at a time. We never get anything accomplished. And so for me, it was this idea of, okay, how's my spiritual life? How did it grow? It began with little forms of prayer, getting the foundation, then building in sacrifice then eventually working from that sacrifice to serving others. And I saw the big picture of the spiritual life. And I said, well, what if I could put that in a microcosm in Lent? You know, start off small with my prayer life, get that foundation, start to know Jesus and become like him. Then I work into personal sacrifices. And then from all that personal transformation, if you will, I move into relational transformation. And that's where all the, the, the build, building up of self-knowledge occurred because I would fail miserably at times, but this is the key. I knew that if I kept going, it wasn't like a 46 day winning streak. I knew that if I kept going, if I got through boot camp, eventually God would allow me to be a soldier in the war. And so I think that we just look at it as not, I failed, but as, wow, the Lord is training me to become who I really am, you know? Yeah. So anyway, that's I just- I think that's great. And, and so men- how Devin mm-hmm. breaks this up in the book is that it's in seven weeks and you start with just two of, of some options that he gives you that you're going to focus on in that week. And then the next week you add on, he gives you five to seven options each week and you add on two more. And so that you can constantly grow in this. So if you're not going to follow the book, no worries, but I'd encourage you to do that, right? I think that what this does for me, at least what it did for me last year when I went through this was I was always adding on to my Lent, right? So it was like giving up chocolate, giving up soda, giving up alcohol, giving up TV. And then now I'll just do all of that all at once, right? And what was happening is, sure, I would give up alcohol, soda, TV, skip breakfast, you know, just I was heaping on all of these things in the new year because my pride wouldn't say, well, wait a minute, I can't just give up chocolate and TV again. I got to give up chocolate TV and something else, right? And that just grew. And what would inevitably happen was because my mind wasn't focused on Christ, wasn't focused on these things as well as they should have been is that I would inevitably slip up on two or three things. And I'd pat myself on the back that I still had two or three things that I was doing. <laughs> and so this, this is uh, an excellent method of just switching that whole thing. And like, you know what? Let's just start and get this right. And with his daily reflections and these prayers and stuff like that, you're able to do that. You're able to have a concrete 
plan, a concrete guide. So I encourage you to do something very similar. Break it all up. Don't expect yourself to be able to fast from uh, food on Wednesdays and Fridays, abstain from meats on Wednesdays and Fridays, uh, no sugar, no TV, no alcohol right at the beginning, right? We're missing the point. Like, what are you doing in praying and how are you handling almsgiving? All things like that that's covered um, here. But that is one way that I found in, incredibly edifying and very helpful for me as I was going through this, um, uh, you know, approach that you that you put together. So yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry. Go, oh, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. yeah. So I was just going to say real quick too. Yeah, uh, like to um, reinforce kind of what you're saying is these practices that we 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 give up, and I know this is talked about in the book. But like, there's, there's always like the question you need to ask yourself is what is the impact? Mm. Um, what's the, in order to like, I'm giving up TV in order to what, mm. uh, you know, I'm, I'm giving up alcohol in order to what, you know, because it's like, if you're giving up alcohol in order to be more clear headed, uh, and be more present to my wife, my kids, to God, um, et cetera, or more, okay, there's a value to that. But if it's, I'm giving up alcohol in order to punish myself, uh, if I'm giving up alcohol in order to just for the purpose of mindless yeah, suffering, prove that like I can that's do it. Yeah. Completely yeah. pointless, right? So, yes. what is the impact? Like, what's the in order to behind? the practices that you're embracing for Lent. And, and if you can't answer that question in a clear way, maybe you should ask yourself if it's something you should actually be doing. If I'm going to get up in 30 minutes earlier in order to spend more time in prayer, awesome. That's that's amazing. You know, like do it. Uh, but again, yeah, if it's just that mindless self-punishment, like it's actually setting you back. Like it's actually yes. hurting your spiritual life. And the father David Abernathy again, who's kind of our uh, expert on these things. Like he he's been on episodes before, but he's always talking about how asceticism needs to be a way of life. Like if if Lent all of a sudden you're going from zero to a hundred, it's too much of a shock. Like it just yes. it's a shock to the system. You get grumpy, you get bitter, you get resentful, you give up. All of these things. Whereas like if you're if you're fasting, you're round. If you're doing aesthetical practices year round, praying year round, things like that, like it's going to be so much more natural to just step it up a little bit during Lent, but it's not going to be this artificially imposed stretch of time. And then as soon as Easter happens, you just go back to nothing. Mm. Like that's, mm. that's, there's not, that's not really why. No. That's not really the way we do anything else in life. Um, and if we do, we're, we're bound to fail. So uh, I think it's worth acknowledging that like, as we're like, you're saying, Devin, like look for those practices that you can embrace year round and it, it will be so much more fruitful than just 40 days of intensity and then back to relaxation and absolutely no practices whatsoever. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because, Oh, I'm sorry. But no, because, go for it, what, because what happens though, Sam, is that if I do uh, incorporate these devotions into my life, full time for the rest of my life. It's not an abstinence or it's not a crushing of the spirit. It's actually liberating. It's fulfilling. It's becoming the root new man, the true man. And that's what I've found in my, my own life is it's not like after Lent's over, I'm like, oh good, I just get to go back. No, it, there's this living on and living living life really liberated. And it's it's so beautiful and powerful. I would agree. I would just say that a Lent that's lived well um, and experienced well, you do, you want that more often. And and you get that. I've had conversations with a number of guys later into the year and stuff. They're just like, oh man, I was I was doing it during Lent. I was living it, you know, and they, and and I get it because that's exactly how we're supposed to be. And and spot on, Sam, with the uh, the point of asceticism is to become in a deeper loving union with Christ, our Savior. That is why we do it, not just to prove to ourselves that we can do it, 
But as St. John Climacus stated, that it is in uh, fasting that p- prayer is purified. And I think it was uh, Venerable Fulton Sheen, right, who talked about how prayer unites us to uh, God in heaven and fasting disconnects us to, you know, our love and our passions of this world. Of course, it was said with far more eloquence. And, and um, but, but that's so true that we have to keep that correct. Mm-hmm. We have to keep that mind right. And this is my constant battle when I'm doing asceticism to the point where I've done so much um, ascetical practices that I forget while I'm doing them and I almost go into autopilot, you know, and I'm, I'm not certainly um, missing the mark, right? I'm, I'm missing the intent and the opportunities that are presented uh, within that. And so I think those are all such great points, yeah. I, I think that's okay. I think if you get to the point where it's a little bit autopilot, that's okay. Um, because that's just your way of life. It's like you're praying ceaselessly without, you know, a lot of people aren't aware that they're praying, but they are praying because they're continuing the presence of God without moving their lips and without actually formulating prayers in their mind. And, and I think that's okay because that's the way that the, the Christian man should be. He should be operating his life at such a level where he eventually doesn't even notice that he's doing it. He's, he's not so self-conscious that he's so aware of himself, he's he's scrutinizing his own activity. He is just being who God has created him to be. That's the goal where you're just naturally who you are and then you just shine with God's grace. Yes, we want to be intentional about loving him, all that. But I think it's great, John, that you get to this point where you're like, wow, it's just kind of automatically happening. That's God in you. That's wow. Christ doing the work in you. That's powerful. I appreciate it. I wish I, no, God's will be done. That's, that's good. Um, and, uh, and keep that going. So thank you. Um, well, I think it's a perfect opportunity, Devin. I'd love for you to lead us in the third principle that is so important for us men to be thinking about and to keep on our minds. We've already been alluding to it throughout this uh, episode, yes. but I think it's important to just zero in. Yeah, it's humility, you know, and, and I would say humility with perseverance. And, and I remember when I wrote Joseph's Way and I was reflecting on comparing St. Joseph to Jacob, the patriarch. And I realized that there was this idea of humiliations lead to humility and humility embraced allows us to rise in fortitude and fortitude is the place of courage, you know? Mm. And so in the magnanimous man, he doesn't give up. He's large hearted, large soul, but it's all based on the first part, which is humiliation. And Lent is perfect for humiliation, <laughs> you know, because we start to take on these things and we're humiliated in the fact that, gosh, my flesh is so weak. And so what I, I know you've talked about it before on, on podcasts, but self-knowledge, that's the key to the spiritual life. And self-knowledge, humilitas es veritas. Humility is truth. And so if we really have the truth about ourselves, we're going to grow in humility. And Lent is all about gaining that true self-knowledge. So here's where I think it begins though. And when when I go to prayer and I'm asking Jesus through the gospel to reveal who he is to me, after I look at Jesus, he becomes like a mirror a divine mirror. I'm looking into him. I'm like, wow, you're, you're so persevering. You're so compassionate. You're so unafraid of rocking the boat. And then I look back at me and I'm like, oh man, I am so unlike you, Lord. And that's the place of humiliation right there. He's like, Lord, I'm not like you. So please make me like you. And that's why Peter's my man. You know, I love St. Peter because he's confronted repeatedly with his weaknesses. Yet he reconciles himself to Jesus continually through them. And Jesus reconciles himself to Peter, but so much so, and I love this, that Peter becomes another Christ. He's literally crucified. I live the life that's crucified, Jesus in me. So as St. Francis de Sales, one of our faves, he he says the road uh, to humility is paved with the sharp stones of humiliations. And so Mm -hmm. I think it's fantastic in Lent when we begin to feel our weakness. And when we, we have some failure at our penitential commitments, because that just kind of wakes us, hey, I'm not Christ, I'm not God. And I think that that's, that's the first place, that's the identity piece, you know? And, and I think it's like, who was saying it before? Sam, John, I don't know which one, but, but the idea of these small sacrifices, these small devotions, we out of the gate, we just want to do it big. And I think that, God wants us to begin small because that's a place of humiliation. And that humiliation opens us up to embracing the virtue of humility that he wants to give us. And you look at the young boy with the seven loaves, right? The seven loaves and two fishes. It's all we have. 
seven loaves. But what does he do? He gives Christ those seven loaves and then he multiplies it to feed the crowd. Same with the wine at Cain of Galilee. He transforms that little water into wine. And I think that that's what the Lord specializes in. Give him your smallness, your littleness, your little sacrifice, what you're capable of doing perhaps in your nature, and then allow him to transform that, multiply it and transform because that's what he's great at doing. So I just think that Lent is a great time for self-knowledge, but it begins with knowing Christ and recognizing I'm not like you, Christ but I want to be like you and I'm going to try at this. I'm going to keep trying at this, hoping that you will aid me and he will aid. But I think that he wants us to experience a little bit of, oh, I'm not God, so that we can allow God to come in us and live in our weaknesses so we can become strong in him. Yeah. I, I, I agree with all of that. It's, it's, it's amazing like to reflect on. And I, I think it draws forth the point too that where does Christ meet us? What where is the kind of like that font of our salvation, right? Like it's the cross. Yes. Christ meets us at the bottom, like at the lowest place, like the place of utter humiliation, rejection, despair. Um, it's it's that it, it's like that inverted triangle, right? Like he, he's at the bottom, like he used to be at the top, uh, but like that beautiful passage in Philippians where it's like Christ was God. He like literally had all the adulation of the angels and everything. And yet, what did he do with that? He set it all aside and he emptied himself. The Greek word is kenosis um, and became, took on the form of a servant, you know, and, and he learned, he, he entered into the most humble, like humiliating form of crucifixion. And a lot of, you know, there's nothing in scripture that, that explicitly says us, but it's heavily implied that Christ was even stripped completely naked on the cross. Like think about how humiliating that would be. Not only are you suffering, but like, you know, a lot of our crucifixes is like out of respect for our Lord. Don't display that. Although there, I have seen some that, that do, but like how humiliating to not be beaten, scourged, rejected by the people that you're there. You're their Messiah, their rightful King. And yet they're, they're crucifying you and humiliating you and mocking you and spitting on you. And like, just, just the ultimate humiliation. So if you're feeling humiliation in your life, you're in good company. Like mm. Christ emptied himself and that's where he chose to meet us. And I will say too, like a lot of us, we recoil from humility. Usually we're like, well, isn't it just like self-loathing? Isn't it just shame? Like, isn't it just like rejecting myself? Like, does that mean I'm worthless? No, like think about it because if Christ meets you there, the most valuable person in all creation embraced humility it's not about being worthless it's about emptying yourself and i think that's this is the point is that you know i heard someone say once like kenosis is theosis like theosis meaning divinization or participation in the life of god like you want to be like god you want to share in god's life then you must empty yourself because that's what god is doing all the time and the more you embrace that that self-emptying, the more like God you become. It's this beautiful circle, if you will, that where we we look to God in Christ as his example and humility, and then we see our own failings. And that's exactly it. I want men to, to really get honest and deep within your failings this Lent, your vices, those things that are keeping you down. Because again, that's the addition, not the subtraction. When we are going into it and we are understanding, you know what? Okay, sure. Maybe you're successful at giving up chocolate TV and alcohol for 46 days. Congratulations. But what does that mean if we are not truly emptying ourselves, as we talked about earlier and as Sam was bringing up again, this, this self-emptying? And I tell you what can do that, what can humble us um, is, is going being very excruciatingly honest about the vices uh, that are that are keeping us down. Um, humility is what can guide us to success, not just being humbled by the fact that maybe you failed with some of your ascetical practices, but humbled by the choices in life and by the uh, the attitude that uh, maybe you you're that's still holding you down in life so that you can no longer be self-reliant 
but be instead reliant on the cross, which is exactly where we need to be put on our minds. I'm, th- I'm thoughtful of the, the woman who was hemorrhaging for 12 years, right, in scripture, and, and she, she had to just touch the hem of the, of the cloak of Jesus, right? She had to humble herself. She had had 12 years of this, and then she had to humble herself. She had to get down to the lowest of the low to just sneak in there and touch his cloak. And, and we can look to that as our example of, of what can occur during Lent if we allow it to. We can humble ourselves that low, and all we need to do is keep our mind and focused on Christ and touch his cloak and allow ourselves to be transformed and allow ourselves to be renewed in him and to become better like him. And, and that is where this principle of humility as an overarching theme that needs to be with us in Lent, yes, and throughout the rest of our lives is so important to our growth as men. Yeah, that's great, John. And in fact, what you said earlier is extremely powerful. Like, hey, I nailed it with giving up chocolate. I nailed it giving up alcohol. Yeah, but examine yourself. When you look into the mirror and you see the face of Christ, you're looking at the gospel and you learn of who Christ is, are you critical? Are you judgmental? Do you blame other people for your problems? Are you always putting people down in your mind? Are you jealous? Are you envious? Is there someone you haven't forgiven? Have you maybe not even forgiven yourself for the past? I've ran into tons of guys like this. The point I'm trying to make is this, is we can hold all of the real work out here and we can say, oh, look, I'm doing all this really good stuff for the Lord. But the Lord is like, man, I wanna operate on your heart. I don't need all these actions. I want to operate in your heart. So if these actions, like Sam was saying, if these actions get us there, great. But if we're just holding God out with these actions, like, oh, I'm fasting, I'm praying, you know, I'm doing all, we're just holding them out. That's no good. I, I think it's really good to have that checklist. Am I envious? Am I jealous? Do I criticize? Am I blaming the government, the Pope, whoever, you know, for my problems? You know, it's my wife. She did it. You know, it's my kids. They're the problem. You know, if only my boss would give me more money, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know what? Look at Jesus and then examine yourself. And then just, this is the great place. Lord, I am not like you, but you can make me like you. And so I think this is a perfect time with the few minutes we have left to talk about the fourth principle, which is that uh, no man being put on is capable of truly being a man if he's not giving forth. And this is the other part of of Lent, which also comes up in the book, and it even gives some examples and some opportunities uh, to fulfill. But I would say that it takes courage. Uh, It takes courage to... um, put on the new man and actually go and bring Christ to other people that maybe don't want to hear it or maybe aren't Mm. in a state right now. Our neighbors, for instance, we need to go forth and we need to share the love of Christ with them, right? Relationships being separated was something that happened at the fall. And yes, giving forth in tithes and corporal works of mercy are absolutely a part of it. We should be doing that throughout the year. Maybe you're not. Maybe that's something that you wake up during Lent and you're like, what am I going to do? I, I, I Sometimes I write a check. Sometimes I don't write a check, right? <laughs> Let that be a resolve for you this Lent as well uh, to put that aspect on. But I want to take it to the another level and I want to talk briefly about what it means to stretch forth the love of Christ to our neighbors, right? Because that's the second and greatest commandment, as Christ told us, is to love our neighbors as ourselves. And and so it's really important for us to make sure that we take a little bit of time and reflect on how we're going to successfully do that. What is our action plan to do that? And maybe it is just turning to prayer and asking God to open your heart for that and then open those opportunities for that. And I promise you, if you do that, they're going to be available. So I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about giving forth and the importance of that during Lent. So Sam, why don't you take it away from here? Yeah, I, th- this is this is really the heart of the matter, right? Because we're talking about kenosis, self-emptying, you know, these these things. And it's, it's very nice in theory, but like, um, you know, it, it's very difficult in practice. It, that's where that, again, that ego starts squirming a bit, right? Like, oh, are you really going to do this? This hurts, you know? And, um, <laughs> and unfortunately we have so many saints that can, that get, that illustrate this for us. Not only the great saints that come to mind, like, you know, St. Saint, Saint Teresa of Calcutta, um, 
you know, uh, or, or some of those very like charity oriented saints, like we can't all do that. Right. But even St. Teresa of Calcutta, Mother Teresa was always saying, you know, the real hunger, especially in the West is the hunger for love. So a practical example of this would be listening to an annoying person who really rubs you the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have a coworker that just drives you nuts. Or like maybe there's this person at your parish or your school who just does things that drive you crazy. Like if you can just as an act of charity, hold your tongue, maybe listen to them, try to understand their perspective, try to see, you know, their side of the story. Um, and maybe it's unsuccessful, right? But like, just give it that that try. That's an act of generosity. Obviously, there's there's financial generosity. I'll let you know other people speak to that. But like, that's another one that I think like Saint Louis Martin, that uh, is, you know is obviously the, the father of uh, Saint Therese of Lisieux. Um, he went in, in her autobiography, a story of a soul. Like, her, she talks about him sneaking off. Uh, her father and he'd take Therese sometimes, but he was, they were well off uh, for their time. And he would, he would bring, you know, food, money, whatever they needed, clothing to people that he knew were struggling, who were financially destitute and would bless them in that way. And it, that resonated in St. Therese's heart. And like, she brought that interior generosity to those difficult nuns uh, that she had to live with sometimes that, you know, like she had this one nun that drove her nuts um, and she, <laughs> but she would intentionally go out of her way to like dote on that nun, right? Like she would just shower that nun with affection and love. And after she died, like this nun had no idea that, that St. Therese was like completely irritated by this woman. And she thought she's like, she was St. Therese's favorite because the way Therese just like poured out her. Like that's generosity, like that's kenosis, right? And so we can learn from the saints, like how to do that. Last thing I'll say is forgiveness is a massive act mm -hmm. of generosity and giving forth. And in a sense, like at a natural level, forgiveness isn't necessary. Like if someone's really hurt you and like, you know, wounded you, you can conceivably hold that grudge for the rest of your life like it's going to be acid in your soul and eat away at you but you could do it and you could say like <laughs> justice you know like they really hurt me and i'm not gonna let that go right yeah. but if you know if you want to take it a step from the natural level to the supernatural level the order of grace right then forgiveness is necessary because we're trying to be like god and god never stops forgiving us 70 times seven, right? Infinity. Like that's how much God forgives. And if we want to embrace that, for, we want to receive that forgiveness. We also have to give it. It's an act of generosity. It shines forth, right? Like we're talking about like radiation, right? Like it's like the sun. It shines. And like that's what we're after is radiating the life of Christ. But Christ, like even when he was being nailed to the cross, like actively, it's like, Father, forgive them. Like, and if, if you can't do that, and then you're always going to be kind of excluded from that order of grace, right? Like yeah, that, amen. That level That's of sainthood. So true. Yeah. So Devin, any final thoughts on giving forth and the importance of this here in Lent? I just love the idea of forgiveness, and I think it's really important that there's a there's a two edges to that sword. On one side or two sides of that coin, one side we should examine our life and ask the Lord, who is it that we need to seek forgiveness from? That's very hard, but I'm telling you what, it's liberating. Even if you approach them and they're like, yeah, yeah, I forgive you. And there's nothing more than that it is so liberating and freeing. And on the other side, yes, then you can forgive those who've wounded you, write them a letter, you know, send them an email, give them a call. And that also too is uncomfortable because they're like, what, you know what? I, you know, I didn't do that or whatever. They might be in denial, but regardless, you have done it. And even if it humiliates you, that is where that instead of the subtraction of Lent, that's the addition. Yeah. And man, you get to that point, that's the way Jesus's way is. It begins with the first couple of stages of identity and prayer. And then it builds into, you know, developing that little routine in prayer. And then out of your prayer, knowing Jesus and trying to become like him, you learn to sacrifice and you embrace the sacramental life more so you can have more of him in you. And then you get to the point to where you can forgive and live. 
like where you actually are going forth, like you're saying, John, giving forth. And uh, visit the elderly, man. Visit somebody who you know is unable to get out. Do a project with somebody. That's all listed. These are all listed in there. But you just pick a couple of these. And like St. Francis de Sales says, he says, pick one thing really, and make sure you do it well, then add the other things. But yeah, I love it. But I think forgiveness is at the heart of everything. Yeah, especially Amen. for Lent. Yeah, what a great way to to end this uh, episode or this section of the episode. So I really appreciate that, Sam. And uh, men, you heard it from Devin. We strongly encourage you to get this book, uh, Jesus' Way. There is a link in the show notes. We have gotten uh, 100 copies available and 300 copies on their way, hot off the press, quite literally. And as a, just to to be certain, um, we are going to give every single person, all 400 of you, Uh, the email with the PDF of the first 10 days just to make sure that you can get that going. We're going to ship them out ASAP. The warehouse is ready. So I'm not too concerned about that aspect of it, but I just want to make sure that you are comfortable getting started here on February 14th and making this the best Lent ever with this strategy and with this guide. And we just hope you gained a lot out of this episode. And regardless of what you do, please keep us in your prayers this Lent. We need them and know that you, our listeners, and um, our our donors and Catholic Gentleman Plus members are going to be in our prayers as well. And Catholic Gentleman Plus members, so I don't forget, I'm going to be sending you guys an exclusive discount code for this book to give it even cheaper. So um, all uh, CG Plus members, uh, be on the lookout for that uh, email with a discount uh, for you to get this book cheaper. So again, thank you everybody for joining us on this episode. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Devin, for your wisdom and your thoughts. Uh, It's always edifying and I always greatly enjoy it. And as we end each of our episodes, be a man, be a saint.